All right, it's time for another episode of the Nudgecast, believe it or not, already. I guess we're recording this on a Thursday. Every time I say that in a recording, Mac, I get nervous that I say the wrong day. It's actually One Thursday, day you right? will say the wrong day. Just It's going to happen. You might as well make the mistake in I thought I did it last week, but I, it turns out I was right about it. Um, but anyway, back to the point. Today, we have a really exciting conversation. It's going to be really handy for... I know a lot of the folks we work with, and it's one of the cooler conversations that we get to have. We've done this a couple of times now, or similar things anyway, where we get to talk to someone who's been working with us for a long time, has really been doing a lot of remote coaching, and in this case, has really found a way to be really effective programmatically, engaging clients, and also growing a business and a team around remote coaching. So this is going to be a really cool conversation for us having been kind of a part of this journey with, with Brittany, but um, also hopefully for you guys that are listening. So with that in mind, uh, we're talking to Brittany Kennedy. She's the founder and CEO of On Point Nutrition. Brittany, thanks so much for doing this with us. Yeah, I'm excited to uh, share my story. <laughs> That's, let's start there. Why not? Let's, How about you let's tell us do it. How the hell this all happened? <laughs> yeah, so, so I founded on point about five and a half, six years ago. Um, and I previous to starting on point, I was working for another company, uh, doing all in person work. So this on point was definitely my first dive into remote coaching. Uh, but I wanted to start a remote co- coaching practice because I was seeing the pitfalls of doing in person work. Um, uh, you know, we're, a a telehealth practice. So we provide nutrition counseling. So previous to starting on point, I was doing nutrition counseling, but it was all in person. Um, so I was just seeing, you know, the issues that most people see in, in person coaching, you know, people are missing appointments. You don't have any touch points between sessions. Um, so I kind of took what I learned and decided to start this remote coaching business. And it was, uh, just myself for about a year. And then, you know, fast forward five and a half, six years later, and now we are a team of 12, uh, including myself. And um, we've worked with about 2,500 clients in the last five and a half, six years. So yeah, it's pretty crazy when you think about it. But real quick story (laughs) for everybody, because this is, I think, pretty, I know Brittany and I have talked about this. You were one of the first coaches I ever talked to when we first started Nudge. Mm -hmm. And I I, I think, you, were you still doing coaching? I mean, because you're not coaching as much anymore at this point. No, I'm not coaching anymore. Uh, I maybe have like two people. That yeah, I guess, yeah. <laughs> that but I, it's, I think you and I both met pretty early on in one of those journeys. Mm-hmm. And I felt like, and we've talked about this before, where we were kind of ahead of the curve and we're talking about like online and remote coaching. And I think everyone thought we were crazy for a long time. Oh, people thought I was nuts. Yeah, like, people thought I was was crazy too, but it was kind of neat to see similar background stories. Kind of, we both connected early on five or six years later. I mean, it it is amazing what you all have built because I know a lot of our partners that we work with have aspirations to get to the point where you are. And I think everyone's trying to figure out how do you go from just being a solopreneur, getting into the remote coaching or online coaching space, and then Mm -hmm. getting to Britney status. Yeah. Oh, should I trademark that? (laughs) Britney status? I just made it up. Britney Britney status. status. Right when you said it too. I'm interested in that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, I'll file for the rights for that. Um, so, I mean, I think one of the things that you have to establish early on in the game is that you have to make a decision of whether or not you're going to be a solopreneur, you know, which is totally cool if that's your jam, um, or if you're going to build a team, because how you approach your business and how you approach creating programs and how you approach approach really anything day to day really depends on those two things, right? Because how you run a solo practice is much different than how you run a group practice. Um, When I first started, people always asked me that they were like, Oh, so is this just like something you do? Like just you. And I was like, no, like, I don't want to be, I don't want to be coaching people five years from now. I mean, don't get me wrong. I loved it. You know, and I, I met a lot of really great people, but um, that's not where I saw myself. You know, I saw myself mm-hmm. running a business, coaching a team, which essentially is coaching, you know, but just yeah. my staff. Coaching coaches. Yeah. Coaching coaches, essentially. Um, I saw myself doing that. So I think that's step one, really, is to be very clear in what the goal is. You know, my goal was never to just be me. Uh, I'm a 
very firm believer in power in numbers. And I think you can accomplish more and be able to do more with more mm -hmm. people, the right people. I'm curious, as you've been going along, um, one of the things that I've noticed from where I get to sit, Brittany, is that you have an organization where I would say that like five of our 30 or 40 most engaging single coach accounts in terms of how many of their clients are engaging on an ongoing basis um, with them through the app um, are all on point coaches, which is just mm -hmm. a crazy statistic to me, given that there are literally thousands upon thousands upon thousands of coaches on our system. So, I mean, just knowing that since I'm telling you that, I don't know if you knew that beforehand, but, yeah. um, what do you think is happening that is allowing you guys to be so engaging in terms of how you're working with your clients? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I, I really look at coaching as a partnership with your clients, right? I mean, you really have to learn a lot about your client and be really interested and invested in their success, right? And we all know that the more often you remind someone of something, the more likely they're going to do it, right? And the more likely they're going to be engaging. So for us, the key for engagement is, you know, frequent touch points, not too many, How, because we, so, that becomes yeah. annoying. <laughs> Can I interrupt you real quick on that? Because yeah. I think this is one of the greatest pitfalls we see in implementation mm. is a complete, I'll say bastardization of communication what do you feel is an appropriate amount in terms of frequency that mm -hmm. the styles of messages would love to hear you kind of break that down yeah. a little bit? Um, I mean, we don't message our clients maybe more than once or twice a week, at least once a week. Once a week is the minimum touch point for us. Um, my team members can definitely touch base more often depending on the person, but once a week is usually the, the minimum. Mm -hmm. uh, anything more spread out than that, people just kind of forget that you're there, right? Because yeah. I think what coaches have to remember is that your clients have a lot of other stuff going on in their lives, right? Like nutrition is not the number one priority of our clients, <laughs> although we wish it was. Yeah, um, It's a priority for them, but it's not the only priority. So at least one touch point a week is key, right? If you're not touching base with your clients once every single week, you've lost them, right? You're not in their mind. Uh, but you also don't want to be messaging them every single day because that's annoying, yeah. right? I mean, let's just be honest. I like, love to hear you say that. Is, and have you, do you all have, I mean, annoying. were there moments, any stories you had of like, did you all start doing it that way at first? And then you were like, wow, this is getting to be too much or what, um, what prompted the I don't think we ever started it that way. I don't, I don't think so. I think for us, I mean, I think about the, that messaging is like, I mean, the messaging and feed feature and nudge is great, but I think about it like a text message feed, right? Like, mm -hmm. I don't want a text message from my mom every single day, okay? Like, I just don't. She does, you know, and that becomes somewhat annoying, right? And so I think we have to remember that some of this is very simple. Some of this is like basic things. And I think people overthink it and they overcomplicate it. And then that's when they're like, oh, I got to send a message every day to remind them to drink water and blah, blah. Like, listen, if you keep sending the messages every day, they're going to turn off their notification on their phone and then they're not going to get any of your messages. Right. right. Uh, Brittany, music to my ears. I, so there's two, I'd say two things we typically see, two pitfalls. Yeah. Either coaches send too many messages too frequently because I think it's, they're trying to overcompensate for being remote or asynchronous. And they say, oh God, because right. I'm not with my client, I have to send them messages every day to stay in front of them. Or they send messages that I swear are thousand word messages. Oh. And then their clients open them and they say, WTF is this. So no, long. I'll answer this later. And you for, and the coaches don't realize it's, I think you summed up, it's like, how would you communicate with your friends? You're not going to do right. either of those. Mm -mm. No. If you, if the text that you're sending is larger than the actual screen that someone's viewing it on, they're not going to read it. That's like, rule. <laughs> like rule number one. I mean, I, I learned this a lot in um, um, like, I'm really interested in sales and marketing too. And obviously I'm very involved in that with our company. And one of the big things that I always tell team members, especially when they're putting together like marketing emails and things like that, these messages and nudge are the same thing. If someone has to scroll to read what you sent them, they're not going to read it. 
They're not even going to read the first two sentences. They're just going to see that it's a lot, feel overwhelmed and just close it. Right. So it's like short, sweet, to the point, And that's it. Right. Yeah. Because if the person on the other end getting the message as a question, they'll ask. Right. If they feel like the message isn't enough, they'll be like, hey, can you tell me more about this? And then that's how you keep them engaged. Right. So you give them like just enough to understand what's going on, but maybe not the whole story that it brings them into the conversation. So then that's how they become and stay engaged. I love that rule though. I, and I'm wonder if we can coin this somehow though. That's like, think so, about your mom texting you and using that as the rule. Yeah. Like my mom probably texted me today. There's a text on my phone right now. Probably her. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> but it's, it is, it's thinking about how you would communicate with a friend and, and mm-hmm. really putting yourself in those shoes. Cause I think it's for some reason, I feel like coaches, it's like once you put a phone in their hands or they start going asynchronous, they kind of forget all of the simple stuff. Right. And it's almost a deer in headlights. And I, it's mm-hmm. great to hear you say that. And do you all do much training on that? I mean, is that something when you, when coaches are coming in, you're kind of um, helping educate we, them on? Yeah, we do. I mean, and for us, there's, there's a process, right? And a lot yeah. of it is just reminding our team members that you're a human, you're interacting with another human, you know, and so be human about your interactions, right? It's not normal to send multiple messages in a day to someone, unless you're having an active conversation, right? Mm-hmm. Then that's different. Uh, but yeah, the more human, the better. And I think that's how we approach all of our counseling here. I mean, for us, we try to find a nice middle ground between, you know, we're not as lackadaisical as someone's friend, you know, but we're not as serious as their physician say, not knocking physicians. They're great, but they're a little bit different. And we kind of live in the middle, you know, so we are personable, you know, we communicate as if they were our friend, but we hold people accountable to what they've committed to. Right. So it's a nice kind of middle ground. You can feel free to take a, a little poke at, at physicians if you want to on this podcast. We yeah. do love our physicians <laughs> that we work with, but you know, here, here's what tends to happen, I think, and, and maybe you can clean this up a little bit because it won't be a perfectly put together idea, but mm-hmm. we have to kind of reframe a lot of how people are thinking about how they're communicating through our system is your goal isn't to, your first goal anyway, isn't education, it's engagement, right? So it's contact. Yeah. Yeah, yeah mm-hmm. absolutely. So capture their attention first, then we can worry about how you're going to communicate that tone that you have in your head right now about mm-hmm. whatever detailed mm-hmm. thing it may be. Yeah, exactly. And I think that goes back to like the long message mm-hmm. concept, right? It's like you have to get someone engaged first so then you can have a conversation and coach them that way right? Because people only can digest small amounts of information at a time, right? Especially adults, right? So coaching adults is totally different than if you're coaching kids, right? Like kids are like sponges. You can give them so much information. They just like suck it all in and they remember all of it. It's like so weird. Um, But adults, not so much. (laughs) It's interesting. I mean, these, these, it makes me wonder as we were thinking about kind of, as you started, you're talking about kind of the intention you had of wanting to scale this business and, you know, hire team members and growth the way you did. It just makes me wonder how much kind of training material you all have had to put together in systems for you all to get to where you are now. And Mm -hmm. is that something that I think I'm I'm kind of getting back around to your first hire? I mean, who was this first hire you brought in because it almost makes me wonder, is it an ops person or is it just more coaches? And you finally had to kind of figure out the operational side. No. So all my first hire was uh, another dietitian, you know, so someone to come mm-hmm. on and counsel clients. So the brain behind the ops is me. <laughs> <laughs> I am the ops. Um, the ops. And my husband is my business partner. So he is as well. Um, but all of my hires for my team have, with the exception of one person who focuses on sales, um, all of them are dietitians or nutritionists. So gotcha. they're actually coaches. Right. So um, I have, we have been slightly blessed in the fact that my husband, Doug, and I are able to do all the ops on our own. Um, And previous to me starting on point, the company that I worked for, I did all of the, um, not all of it, but a lot of the hiring and the training for them. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I had a good amount of experience in that, but 
putting together training materials for a remote coaching business is totally different than when I was coaching people who yeah. were working in person with clients. So I think processes, training materials are all crucial, right? You have to have them, especially when you're building a group, right? Because you want your team members to be um, independent thinkers, right? And you want them to look and feel like independent real people. You know, you don't want them to be like on point robots mm. where they're doing the same thing all day. So you want them to have a little bit of, you want them to have their own individuality, but there has to be processes and procedures in place in order for the experience for clients to be the same across the board, you know, and that's where putting together those training materials is really important, but it's also important to remember that just because you put something together doesn't mean that that's what it's going to be for the, till the end of time. Right. So as you, for us, really our training materials like evolve all the time. Like, and I think as a growing business, mm -hmm. you just have to accept that things change all the time, you know? So you always have to revisit it. You always have to look at what's working, what's not working, you know, and you figure that out by communicating with your clients. Hey, so circling back real quick, you mentioned something that comes up a lot during implementations that we deal with, especially with teams, that whole idea that the coaching experience itself is shaped so much by the coach. And what is that? I guess, where's that line of the um, having kind of a standard offering of, hey, you know, if you sign up for on point, you know what you're going to get to some extent, but mm -hmm. also still make sure it doesn't feel robotic. I mean, what it sounds like you are delivering weekly messages. I mean, what, I'd be curious to know kind of what are the constraints and where's the flexibility in that offering? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I would say that's probably the most difficult thing to figure out is the balance of mm -hmm. automation versus individualization. Because right? authenticity and is so important. A hundred percent, right? Mm -hmm. Like you, you have to be working with a real person that has a real personality and is <laughs> like, yeah. that's just key, right? Because if if someone didn't want to work with a the person, they we all know what they would do. They would sign up and download one of those free apps and probably not reach their goals because, you know, <laughs> yeah. they need a real person to coach them. But right. that's for another podcast. Um, so yeah, so I think it's, for us, we give our team just the right level of structure in terms of, you know, in week five, we're going to send out a, a survey to your client and ask them what do they like about their counseling? What, they, what do they not like about it? What goals have they reached? What do they still want to focus on for the next five weeks? You know, so having, I think, benchmarks in place for evaluate, like reevaluation is what's key. And that's what creates structure for our team is knowing that like, these are the benchmarks we're going to stop at this point, we're going to reevaluate, and then we're going to build and move on from there. And then what you learn at those benchmarks is where the individualization comes into play, right? So then you can really take that information that the client's giving you, be able to figure out what they need, and then provide that to them. So the structure comes in, I think, goal setting, which we talked about the other week, um, which is super important. So having that structure based around goal setting is what gives our team a sense of how to, to move forward with the counseling. But then the individualization comes in and the delivery of what the person needs to learn. Gotcha. I think that's the hardest part Yeah, is yeah. finding like that balance. Well, right? Phil and I have had a lot of conversations recently about like the use of frameworks so you can build, measure, learn, and continue to iterate and refine. Because I, mm -hmm. I, unfortunately, I think there's a lot of coaches out there that still are just Hey, you're my client. I'm going to text you from time to time. Therefore, this is remote coaching. And it's like, well, not, not quite. <laughs> nope. 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 We have plenty that, you know, get really excited about the technology tricks that they could pull off and try to launch as if they're a business that's at full scale and automate everything. Um, yeah. So, I mean, it really is just, it's a balance, but it's also sort of like a furious balance. Like you don't want to give up too much of either side of the individualization or the, or the mm -hmm. uh, structure for sure. How did you guys get to that five week point as that first uh, kind of reflection point? Was that just, um, just throw it out there? Or was that learned? Uh, I, that was definitely learned yeah. for sure. I mean, people, we, we consider the first two to three weeks of counseling anyone, the honeymoon phase. Mm -hmm. That's what it is, right? Your clients are going to do great the first two or three weeks. <laughs> Most of them do. 
right? Because it's new, it's exciting. They've just signed up for something. They've paid for something, you know? So they're mm-hmm. like, I'm going to focus on this and I'm going to do a good job. Yeah. So most people do really great the first two or three weeks. It's at that three week mark where yep. something usually happens and yep. they like fall off, don't log a couple days, something traumatic happens in their life or maybe just their life happens life in general, happens. Mm-hmm. right? <laughs> um, and so that five week mark is like just over a month. So it gives you the time like past the honeymoon phase, they probably run into one or two problems at that point. And then that's when we hit them, not hit them, but ask them. <laughs> Yeah. kind of how they're feeling at that point because they're past the shiny new phase mm-hmm. at five weeks and that's when they probably are starting to get into like okay this is actually my problem this is actually what i need help with right. and they then have a better understanding of their own goals and are able to more clearly articulate to their coach like what they actually need help with mm-hmm. because i think what a lot of coaches also don't realize is that the goals that your clients give you in appointment number one are not always the actual goals that they have, right? Those are their like lofty, I just started something new. This is what I want to do goals. A month in, that's when I think it sets in and you're like, is this really a realistic goal for this person? Yeah. So so that's interesting. So that's some diligence that your coaches are doing on a regular Mm -hmm. basis, maybe comparing the the five-week point to what it looked like on day one and seeing how that's changed. Yep. I mean, in our... So our programs are structured in 10 week increments. So that five week is right in the middle of the first 10 weeks that they're working Mm -hmm. with us. Um, But the program lengths is something that I learned over time as well. I mean, when I first started, I just did four week programs and they would renew every four weeks. That's a lot of work. Yeah. Four weeks, like four weeks go by and you're like, yeah, what happened? You know, (laughs) Um, then we did eight weeks. So we doubled four. Um, and that was okay, but eight weeks, isn't quite two months. And so people were like thinking two months, but it wasn't. And then that's when we settled on 10, Mm -hmm. because we also realized that people have those problems usually between week three and five. So then that is what gave us kind of the 10 week increment focus, you know, interesting. So that's definitely interesting. I'm sure that's very different for a lot of the, it's, well, it's definitely different for a lot of the clients we work with. Um, yeah. I'm curious if that, I'm sure it has something to do with the kind of client that you guys are serving. Uh, Where are people usually when they start working with you guys? Um, In terms of their journey, where are they at? Yeah, yeah. Mm, I would say if we're thinking about like the change scale, they're probably at the, I've made a decision, I want to do something phase, but they haven't quite figured out how to do it yet. But they know that they need someone to help them do it. Mm -hmm. So that's usually where people are at when they come to us, which is why that first five weeks is so crucial because most of the clients we work with, like I said, don't know what they need to do at that point. And so they're really just like learning and figuring out like, oh, this is how I actually get moving forward. Um, the average client works with us about eight months. So we have long standing, long term relationships with clients. Uh, but that also is a work in progress too. Right. Mm -hmm. And that depends on how you and every coaching business is different. Right. So for us, our goal is to have longstanding relationships with clients, because in the type of work that we do, um, you know, healthy living and having a healthy lifestyle isn't just something that people magically figure out Mm -hmm. in a week. Right. Mm -hmm. That takes a long time because, you know, you're having to build habits or change old habits. And Mm -hmm. so. I think solidifying structure and length of program when your touch points are is very specific to the practice itself, but you have to figure that out. So are people signing up for kind of subsequent 10 week packages or is there something different Mm -hmm. you transition? Okay. Versus just, yeah. Yeah. So we, um, our programs auto renew. So think of it like a, it's like a, your standard subscription model, like Netflix, but cooler. (laughs) You're like the Netflix Uh, for coaching. (laughs) Netflix for coaching. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so our programs auto renew. So when clients work with us, they know that they start with 10 weeks, but like most people don't just work with us for 10 weeks. Mm -hmm. Like Mm -hmm. that's really just the beginning. Um, and you have to frame that correctly in your initial couple sessions with the client too, and help them understand like, this isn't just 10 weeks. Like this is just your first 10, (laughs) which I I do followed with 
Another I want to follow up on that real quick because you you hit something that's so important. I usually am the one to like geek out over like SAS metrics and things like that. Mm-hmm. You touched on something that I don't think enough coaches really know, which is really their customer lifetime. And when yeah. you sign someone, how much value are you going to get out of that person? Because yep. as much as they're just clients and we want to help them, they're also customers too. And we have to think about numbers. Yep. That the fact I'm really impressed the fact that you knew that because I know you know how much revenue you're getting out of those clients at that point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's key, right? The, I mean, that's how you scale a business. Yeah. I mean, you have to know your numbers, right? You have to know the length of time someone, a client is with you mm-hmm. because, you know, then you're, I mean, we could get real nerdy about this, you know, then you're well, looking at I've got at the like, glasses on. So that's what I'm going right? to do on these yeah. calls. Right. Yeah. So then <laughs> you, know, you go into things like, you know, what's your client acquisition cost? How many times a year do you turn over your client base? Mm-hmm. You know, if, you're ter- if your programs are only six weeks long and that's it, you're turning over your client base multiple times yeah. a year, right? And you're paying a lot of money to acquire those clients. Mm-hmm. Um, now, don't get me wrong. Maybe someone does a six-week program and they knock it out of the park. But for us and what we do, that just mm-hmm. doesn't work, you know, yeah. and and by working with clients for a long time, I think that's why our clients are so engaged, right? Because these are people who we know, right? And like, we know mm-hmm. who their significant other is, right? And right. We, we, I mean, this is remote coaching. You see people at home. I know what people's kitchens look like, <laughs> like, right? Like we know what their kids look like when they're running around like banshees in the background, you know, like yeah. we, um, you know, are really immersed in the client and in their life. So I think that also helps the engagement mm-hmm. too, because we're not just like a text message on the other end of their phone. Mm-hmm. Well, that's an interesting point too. So are you guys always scattering in kind of in-person, in-person face-to-face sessions like this mm-hmm. on a regular yeah. basis? Is that kind of baked into the model? Yeah. So that, I mean, that, I would say that is the model, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, for us, that's really what different, differentiates us between other practices. Right. Um, most clients who start with us begin with twice a week sessions. Mm -hmm. So it's very high touch, very structured Mm -hmm. when they first begin with us. And then over time they can scale, you know, and spread out the frequency of their sessions. So they might start with twice a week, but then maybe it goes to once a week or every other week, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that also is why the clients are so engaged too. Um, But because you talk to someone twice a week, you also don't want to, over bombard them with information because if right. you're talking to them like this twice a week and you're sending them seven messages <laughs> it's mm-hmm. a little bit much right? yep it's a, a, little it's a lot of the coaching yep. yeah so so are those early sessions would you say those are what percentage would you say is actual kind of teaching talking about nutrition what percent is like getting to know you building rapport that kind of stuff uh, i would say it's like 50 50 yeah really and i would say for forever 50 50 yeah. okay yeah <laughs> yeah it was interesting because we we talked this came up on a call earlier and we were talking about just the role of kind of synchronous and asynchronous communication and mm-hmm. really just the importance on the front end and one thing i mentioned was that i think the initiatives we have worked on that have probably not gone as well have been ones in which the organization or coach tried to kind of cut corners and get into the remote asynchronous part of coaching before really building up the rapport on the front end. And if you don't have that connection on the front end, mm-hmm. you're just not going to be able to keep a person engaged for any period of time. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think the, um, so the f- scheduling message feature uh, in <laughs> our beloved Nudge app is <laughs> a blessing, but also a curse at the same time, right? Like yep. definitely don't want to be the coach that schedules the same message at 12 o'clock <laughs> every day <laughs> because they're going to, I mean, your client's going to know that that's not you. Yeah. You know, it's, it's yeah. not now sometimes, I mean, our team does use that recurring daily message sometimes. Um, but we tell our clients that it's not, you us. have to, you right. have to. Yeah. <laughs> we're like, Hey, we're going to set a reminder that you get every day at 12 o'clock. It's going to remind you to drink water, whatever we decide. Mm-hmm. Um, but you have to tell them, right? Like, this isn't me. This is the machine sending it to you. Um, and then you have to, you know, sprinkle in the non-automated messages. So then mm-hmm. they realize that, oh, this is actually a real mm-hmm. human on the other side. Yeah. That is actually one of the other big pitfalls we've seen before is I've, I've had meetings before where we came in 
And the coaching team had put too much reliance on that without actually telling clients that, hey, I'm going to be scheduling all these reminders for you. And then the coach, I mean, excuse me, the client starts saying, is that even, is there actually a coach on the other end or is this all robotic? And that, I yep. mean, once you, once that thought crosses the client's mind, I think you've kind of lost them. You have. Yeah. That's when people turn their notifications off on their phone. Mm-hmm. Yep. So that's when like, it's all over for us, for sure. That's when it's that's all when over. That's when we're all done. <laughs> we're all done. <laughs> we've all we've it lost up. it at that point. Yep. So, yeah. I mean, you have to use it as a tool, right? But it can't be, your automated messaging can't be the coach, mm-hmm. right? And I think that people who have a remote coaching practice have to know and accept that this type of counseling is more hands-on than someone who's coming into an office to see you, right? It's, it's different. So there's a little bit more work that goes into it, but if you're using the tools correctly, it all kind of works together. Yeah. It really speaks to the value of remote coaching. There's so much more opportunity to, you know, be in their life in a kind of seamless way without bombarding them. Like you said. Yes, yeah. um, exactly. A question think, for you, just because I know yeah. we're getting a little bit tight on time is mm-hmm. just for those, I think for a lot of coaches, there's so many systems and tools out there that they're trying to figure out what to use and how to get started. You mentioned nudge. What are some just couple other systems or platforms you're using that have like really helped you scale your business that you rely heavily on? Um, so we, uh, we rely super heavily on HubSpot. Uh, are you guys familiar? Yeah. yeah. For, we use the CRM, like for which part of it? Uh, so we host our website on gotcha. HubSpot. Yeah. Yep. And then we also use it for the CRM. Um, and then all the email marketing, all that kind of fun oh, cool. stuff is yeah, in so there. Know. Yep. Yeah. We use the whole shebang. Um, and that's great too, because that <clears> also <throat> allows a certain level of automation for my staff too. Right. So that helps to keep them organized and know when they need to check in on clients or when they need to email someone. Mm-hmm. Um, so HubSpot is great because it does a ton of stuff and it's, it's perfect for the small to medium sized business. Mm-hmm. Right. It's like, mm-hmm. and their support team is amazing. So they like hold your hand when you set the whole thing up, they really coach you through how to use it. So you're not just like thrown on this gigantic platform and like, yeah, good luck. Yeah, yeah, good luck. It's amazing. You can have the best platform, but if the service side of the business is less than ideal, it can completely torpedo the whole experience. Oh, yeah. I had like monthly meetings with my HubSpot guy. He was great. Yeah. He'd, like review that's... what I've set up, give me feedback on my email workflows. He'd be like, Super oh, why cool. aren't you using this feature? You're paying for it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You that's also nice this. when they say that too. <laughs> yeah. He's like, there's this whole thing in here that you're not utilizing. I was like, oh, oh um, here we go. So yeah. So we definitely use that. And then I'm trying to think. So, I mean, that's the big one. Nudge obviously is a huge one for us. Um, and aside from that, you know, just like our scheduler, we schedule mm-hmm. clients. What do you um, use for your scheduler, by the way? Cause I've seen that on your website and I, I was actually really intrigued by whatever you use. Cause I thought, it, what was it? Uh, it's, I said, it's fancy. Oh, oh it's fancy. Um, there you go. It's, uh, it's acuity. A-C-U-I-T-Y. Gotcha. gotcha. Yeah. Um, there's this night. It's nice. It's like straightforward, not too many bells and whistles, mm-hmm. gets the job done, but looks really nice. Was it, um, remind me, is that the one, can a person actually select which coach they want to book a call with? Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which that is the difference. I think usually what we see are, there's plenty of tools out there for scheduling. I think our partners are sometimes asking us once they get beyond one coach, I feel like that's where some of the complexity comes in when you're balancing multiple team members. Yes. Yeah. I previously used um, VCDA for a while as mm-hmm. well, which mm-hmm. was really great, but their system is like all inclusive, like scheduler, yeah. CRM, email, you know? And so for us, I almost, we almost grew out of it a little bit when we moved into HubSpot. So then HubSpot handles a lot for us. But then we use Acuity because it's more straightforward. But you can create as many individual calendars as you want on Acuity. So like all 12 of my team members each have their own individual calendar. Um, And what's nice is that the woman, uh, the the member of my team who handles sales um, and does a lot of the initial like onboarding Mm -hmm. calls for new clients, she can see everyone's schedule as well. So when she's doing, you know, first appointment, 
scheduling of clients, she can go in and see everyone's calendars and it's just very easy to use, mm -hmm. but yeah, I would highly recommend it. And it's very inexpensive too. Awesome. That is really awesome. Oh, I know the yeah. early stage coaches are really going to appreciate that. We use Calendly, which is very, very similar to Acuity. So it's both yes. awesome system. I think Acuity is also now baked into Squarespace, which might be handy for anyone who has that kind of site as well. It is. Yeah. So you can actually <laughs> on Acuity, you can take uh, payment for programs right, right. through Acuity, cool. which we don't use that feature. Um, yeah. We use the, um, oh gosh, Chargebee is mm -hmm. what we use oh, yeah. for our subscription. Uh, so the payment and subscription stuff mm -hmm. we use through Chargebee because it's way more robust and the payment mm -hmm. uh, feature in Acuity just wasn't enough for what we were building. Mm -hmm. um, but if your billing structure is pretty streamlined and simple and there aren't a bunch of options unlike ours, uh, you can do the billing right through Acuity too. Does Chargebee, is that Stripe? Power? Is it sit on top yes. of Stripe? Gotcha, mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. So you have a Stripe account, then you plug in your Stripe account into Chargebee. Exactly. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, but Chargebee is nice because it has individual like client logins, you know, so like our clients from their member portal on our website can click like their billing button and then it opens up their billing portal so they can see the credit card they have on file when they were last billed, they can download invoices. Um, That's huge. I think you'd be is how many questions we get from partners around payments because there are so many options out there to actually collect a dollar but to manage yeah. subscription payments in an elegant way i think is actually a very complex thing it is uh, i love charge v it's there a lifesaver go. it I'm really glad, glad you mentioned it because of how are much you, we get asked about it, it like, are you sponsored by charge v and hubspot i feel like you do a great <laughs> job of uh, nope. you have a sign like <laughs> love hubspot love shout HubSpot. out to hubspot Love Charge I'll have to tag them in all this. Uh, yeah. If you use Zapier, you can connect your Charge B to your HubSpot and you can bring in notifications when people pay into your HubSpot. Speaking of Zapier, HubSpot can account. we all just can we all agree here Zapier is fantastic? It's the coolest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah. That's the advanced <laughs> class for everybody. I mean, right. I I definitely use it a lot for sure yeah. to just connect all the dots for our systems, but it's cool to hear that you use it too. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think this At the is end important of the day, you're like can I connect these two things that I want to use? Yep. Let's go to Zapier and see if I can. Yeah. I think you have to get to that point though, where you, it sounded like you pretty early knew you wanted to get to the point you weren't working in the business. You were, you know, you were, you were managing the business. You were able to get out of it in terms mm -hmm. of see it from a higher level. And I yeah. think you have to start thinking through this, what systems are going to help kind of automate out, automate yourself you out in different ways. Yep. And you have to be okay with letting go of systems that you really like to move on to systems that are going to serve you better in the long run, right? So you have to know as a small business, the things that you're using when mm -hmm. you have 50 clients, that's not going to serve you when you have 600. Yep. It just, mm -hmm. It's just not, you know? And so you have to be a little bit proactive about knowing when that switch needs to happen, right? Like for us, the switch to charge B. I don't even know when it was. My dog's in the background. I know. Um, <laughs> just popped up. I saw a tail wagging and I was like, I don't. Yeah. Yeah. Behind. Yeah. Yeah. But you have to know when that switch is. Like, I think for us, it was very clear because the administrative side of it was just becoming too much. Like mm -hmm. we were using QuickBooks for all of our billing, um, which has somewhat of an automated subscription feature in it, but like not really. So it got to a point where it just became too much. Mm -hmm. so you had and then I found Chargebee with QuickBooks. Yeah. For that I mean, part, I still, you may still be using it. Yeah. I still use it, but I broke up with it for that part. Um, but then now I'm on the Chargebee train. Chargebee, HubSpot, Acuity. Nudge. There you go. There you go. The I big four. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Those are my line it. items. I love um, it. All right. So we're getting we're getting a little short on time here. So let me get out of get you out of here on this. Um how would you say kind of as you've grown through this kind of journey that you've taken, your kind of life has changed at this point with what you do? And you said 12 employees now that are mm -hmm. coaches. Yeah. I mean, what's different at this point? What can people who are thinking about this for themselves look forward to? And then we'll, we'll let you go, <laughs> even though we want to keep asking you questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I think what is diff I mean, it's always a hustle, yeah. right? And I'm a firm believer of the hustle. You know, like there's some people who are like, you shouldn't hustle too much, you know, they get tired, you get burnout. No, you just hustle all day. 
It's the only way you get things done. So I just think that the hustle changes over time. You know, mm-hmm. like when I first started, it was like seeing clients, marketing, getting, trying to get stories in the newspaper, like all this random stuff. And now as it, you build, as you grow and you bring in other team members, you start to be able to let go of some of that stuff that needs to still happen, but isn't really what I love, right? And now I'm at a point where my day-to-day involves things that I really, really enjoy. And that's when the business can really grow because everyone who enjoys different aspects of the business is now taking care of it, right? So like the person who loves social media, she's on it. I hate it. I'm not good at it. Mm. I had to do it for a while and it it was not good. (laughs) God, I hear that. I handed it off. Um, So I think something to look forward to is like really enjoying what you're doing. I mean, I've always enjoyed what I've done, but like now I get to sit down and say like, okay, what projects am I going to work on today? That's going to help grow the business and make my team's days easier and make the experience for my clients better. Right. Like that's my hustle and that's my grind now. Mm -hmm. Um, Whereas before it was like, I got to deal with clients. I got to do all this random stuff. So I think what people can look forward to is being able to really spend their time doing things they really, really enjoy as it grows. Um, that, a great that's response. That, that was a that great sounds, response. So that was pretty motivating to me. Yeah, but it is hard. I will put that out there. <laughs> I like the hustle. You let go of stuff. So it gets better. Let go. Hustle. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm telling you, I'm a, I tell my team all the time, you got to hustle. If you don't hustle, someone's passing you. Mm-hmm. Firm wow. believer in that. We, yeah. we should we should probably leave it at that. So, all right. So, um, if anyone is interested in checking out what you guys are doing, um, where can they find you? Uh, so they can find us online. Our website is onpoint-nutrition.com. Um, and that's the best place to find us. Check us out. Awesome. All I can say is Brittany Kennedy, everybody. Um, that was another episode of the Nudgecast. We'll see you guys again next time. Cool. Thank you.